moving on, we have the keynote speaker here, already in waiting in the wings. The title of this is Hard Money, Easy Life. Contradictory of such, but I'm sure he'll tell us more. So next up, can you all welcome to the stage with a round of applause, the Warm Expo welcome, Anil Patel. Thank you. Hello, Prague. So this talk is called Hard Money, Easy Life. We're going to keep it very high level, very beginner friendly, uh, very normie friendly. Um, so let's have some fun. And I want to start off by talking about money. More specifically, the application of savings. So what you save in. Now, savings, if you create more value in the world than what you spend, you accumulate savings. You are a net producer. Every net producer has one very important question that they must ask themselves, and it's this. What will preserve value over time? Now, governments would love it if you chose their fiat currency. Why? Well, the more demand there is for it, the more of it they can create without causing too much attention. Not working out very well for them, is it, ladies and gentlemen? So this becomes an obviously bad vehicle to save in long term. And it's the same story wherever you go. So if you can't save in fiat currency, well, you have to look to alternatives. You might know some of these, bonds, precious metals, real estate, stocks, collectibles, and there's a very important point. An alternative savings vehicle needs to actually be accessible to you, and that's something that's quite exclusive. So what happens when we all decide that these are going to be our alternative savings vehicles? Well, we rush into them, we bid up the price, and they attract something called a monetary premium. Now, what's that? Well, a monetary premium is the value in excess of something's utility value. It is being monetized. That is, it's gaining some of the properties of money. Okay, now let's talk about hard money, or the hardness of money. And that means how hard a money is to produce units of it relative to all others. Let's look at a few examples of how these come into existence. I've got the US dollar here, I've got gold, and I've got the orange coin. So the US dollar comes into existence via two ways. It can be printed out of thin air, or it can be loaned into existence by certain banks who have the privilege to do so. That's then destroyed when it's paid back, but both of these are inflationary activities. But don't take my word for it. Here's Fed Chair Jerome Powell in an interview from a few years back explaining how they were able to flood the system with cash during the COVID pandemic. Quote, as a central bank, we have the ability to create money digitally, and we do that by buying treasury bills or bonds, and that actually increases the money supply. So there you have it. If someone can create more units of money, they're going to create more units of money. There's moral hazard there. OK, what about gold? So gold, you can't print it. It requires the coordination of economic resources and has to actually be dug out of the ground. Well, let's look at the supply of gold going back a couple of hundred years. And we can see that it's increasing at an increasing rate. Yes, it's going parabolic. But a nil, gold's at an all-time high. It's doing really well. OK, well, let's adjust the price of gold, not for the government's CPI inflation data, but let's adjust it for the number of US dollars in circulation, and you get a very different story. It never actually surpassed its 1980 peak. Well, what about Bitcoin? Well, like gold, it can't be printed. It's mined. So that's people putting together resources, directing computational power at the Bitcoin network in the hopes of winning new minted Bitcoin in kind of a lottery system that takes place at regular intervals. 
and we see that the amount of computational power being directed at the network is going parabolic as well. More and more power is being directed at this network in the pursuit of new Bitcoin. Fortunately, Bitcoin doesn't care. Its supply is completely irresponsive to the demand or the hash rate of the network. It's programmatic. Anyone can verify the supply, and we know there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. So three very different supply curves. You've got the dollar, clearly going parabolic. You've got gold. Similar story, it's just a bit earlier in its journey, but innovation will take care of that. And then you've got Bitcoin, which is disinflationary. That is, it's increasing, but at a decreasing rate until its terminal inflation rate reaches zero. So hardness is a spectrum. All past and present forms of money sit on this spectrum. And it's a relative comparison. What does that mean? It means this. Save in the hardest money, or you will get poorer relative to those who do. How much poorer? Let me show you. If you chose gold, you got destroyed. But Anil, I picked the best performing stock indice in the best performing equities market, denominated in the strongest currency in the world. Obliterated. What about your house? Maybe your house is your savings vehicle. I don't mean to poke fun, but you got annihilated. Maybe you trust the government to repay its debts, and you bought long-term treasury bonds. Destroyed. So the question is not what will preserve value over time. It's what will best preserve value over time. Because if you're not first, you're last. And I hope I didn't upset anyone. But if I did, good. Consider this your wake-up call. Let's now talk about life, because we all have something in common. Actually, we have two things in common. We were all born, and we will all die. Because we know we're going to die, we place value on our time. But we don't know when that's going to happen. So we value the present relative to the future. This is the concept of time preference. It's the degree to which you value the present relative to the future. Now, this is also a spectrum. If you have low time preference, you're really thinking about the future. Um, you're investing in yourself, maybe your family, your education, your health. You're really, really planning to be around at a later date to see the fruits of your labor. Or you might have high time preference. You're living for the day, you're engaging in hedonism, you're all about that dopamine hit. So that doesn't happen in isolation. You're a product of your environment. There are many things that affect your time preference. Here are some of them. For example, uh, life expectancy. Let's say you live in a country where life expectancy is 60, and someone else lives in a country where the life expectancy is 90. You're going to make different decisions, because you're operating on a different time horizon. Or perhaps property rights. If you're not confident that your government will not seize your property, well, are you likely to become a saver to then invest and acquire a capital good? Probably not. But let's talk about this last point, and that's the expected future value of your money. Now, let's say you are forced to save in your government's currency, and you don't have access to any alternatives, and you don't believe that that currency is going to hold its value over time. Well, what incentive do you have to create value? You're never going to be a saver. Let's now get a bit more optimistic and talk about what makes for an easy life or an easier life. And there's one thing that fundamentally makes our lives better over time, and that is the process of innovation. Here's a great example from a book by Matt Ridley called How Innovation Works. And in it, he documents how one minute of work in 1880 at the average British wage would buy you roughly four minutes worth of kerosene for a kerosene lamp. So one minute of work, four minutes worth of light. Fast forward to 1950, one minute of work at the average wage buys you seven hours worth of light, thanks to the incandescent bulb. 
Now, obviously, we had the commercialization of electrification, electricity grids rolled out, but innovation is fundamentally deflationary. Humans are ingenious. We keep finding cheaper, faster, smarter, better, more efficient ways of doing things, and that goes for lighting, that goes for transportation, that goes for building materials, and it also goes for energy. When we have enough concurrent innovation in a small time window, well, we get propelled into a new age. And we're watching the same thing happening again now. So most of innovation, I hope it's clear, is about taking the scarce and making it abundant. Take the example of textiles, calories, information, and let's just drill down on information a bit. So think about when we went from physical information, say a book, and through microprocessors, we now have digital information. We digitized it. Well, two things happened. The marginal cost of duplicating that piece of information dropped to zero, and the cost of sending and receiving that piece of information dropped to near zero. As the communication networks that facilitate that transfer, as their bandwidth expanded, well, we could do that with more media types as we standardized those formats. Companies then popped up to serve the needs and demands of users, and we ended up with these digital dominant networks. OK, why? Well, it's due to something called network effects, where every additional user to the network brings disproportional benefits to all existing users. So here you can see the example. The white dots represent the users, and the red lines represent the number of potential connections. So you can see as we increase the users by one, the number of connections is growing exponentially. Do you want to be a part of the second most commonly spoken language network? Do you want to be a part of the second most flourishing trade network? Do you want to be a part of the second hardest monetary network? No. It's a winner-take-all competition. There is no second best. In 2008, Satoshi wrote the white paper. And in it, he details all the tools, techniques, processes that go in to creating something very innovative, and that is a scarce digital unit. So before, we had the marginal cost of duplication brought down to zero. Well, now we've removed that. Now there's a real-world cost to duplicating a digital unit, making it hard. So most of innovation is concerned with making the scarce abundant. A very small amount of innovation is about taking the abundant and making it scarce. Because there's one thing you're always going to want to remain scarce or finite, and that is your money, what you save in. If it's going to protect your purchasing power, you don't want it to become abundant. So Bitcoin's the hardest money. And at this point, that's fairly irrefutable. We have the data. If you disagree with it, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. And because Bitcoin is only transacted on the Bitcoin network, that network is going to become the dominant digital network. It will accrue the most users. It will accrue the most capital. It will have the deepest liquidity. And in the 2010s, you already saw this happen by the way. You saw the dematerialization of consumer goods. And now in the 2020s, we're watching the same thing play out. It's the dematerialization of monetary goods. And because Bitcoin's the hardest money now, when a harder form of money emerges, it does so by draining the monetary premiums that have nested in all those other desirable, scarce assets. So what's the point of all of this? Well, here's the summary. Here are the cliff notes. Infinite money is always going to chase scarcer, harder goods. Those goods are going to get monetized. The owners of those goods are then going to turn around and protect the scarcity of those goods, further exacerbating the problem. But on the flip side, when you have finite money, harder money, the only way to acquire some is creating value for others. You have to make things that are currently scarce 
abundant. Easy money, hard life, hard money, easy life. Thank you very much.